Alright guys, I'll just take one minute of your precious time. Just wanted to let all of you know that if you want to practice all these questions using artificial intelligence and practice on a portal which is as similar as your actual PT exam which will give you exact scores which you are likely to get in your exam just register on languageacademy.com.au you can practice as many questions on top of that you can get instant feedback instant scores and instant suggestions on what are the things you need to work on and how to improve your mistakes and turn them into your strength you can also take a full scored mock test you'll get a full scorecard You'll get in-depth analysis, you'll get tutors feedback. One mock test is available for free and four sectional mock tests are available for free. You just need to go on languageacademy.com.au, register over there, use Google Chrome, log in and practice and make sure you get your desired score at the earliest. Now you can continue with the video or you can just log on to languageacademy.com.au and practice all these questions over there as well. All the very best, I'll see you very soon. So Irving Fisher, remember, he cleared up the confusion of what interest was. He said interest is crystallized impatience. It's not some unjust thing. It's not, as Marx thought, exploitation, but Shakespeare had discovered all these 300 years before. Now, when was your age or a little bit younger than you in high school we all had to read The Merchant of Venice. I have two Indian co-authors who are vaguely my age, maybe a little older, but anyway they sort of grew up in India and they had to learn The Merchant of Venice, and actually, they learned it a lot better than L did. They both have memorized The Merchant of Venice. They can recite almost the entire thing by heart. But anyway, when I was in high school it was completely typical to study The Merchant of Venice. I wonder how many of you have actually read it. Who's read The Merchant of Venice? Who this is Yale, am shocked. So a quarter of you has read it. Well, I recommend the other three quarters that you do read it. But the way the play is read now that's the whole story, and I don't think it's the whole story. I think it's quite an unimportant part of the story. I think the heart of the story is Shakespeare's commentary on economics. And so I'm going to try and argue in the next 10 minutes that Shakespeare was not only a great writer, a great psychologist but a great economist.
small asteroids burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and they give a wonderful fireball like this. They often also break up and people near the front will be able to see that there are some blobs because this has already begun to break up. And maybe nothing from that will land on Earth. Maybe it will all burn up or maybe something the size of your fist may land on the Earth and it could go through the roof of your car which is not good for the car or it could go through the roof of your house which is not good for the house but it's not going to kill one hundreds of people or wipe out life on Earth. These are couple of images of the one that came in over to Siberia in the middle of February. This bottom one isn't a good photo but I have included it because you can see it is beginning to break up into bits. Turns out this asteroid had a collision with another one and so was already quite stressed at the point it came into Earth's atmosphere. As it comes into atmosphere it gets very hot, it starts burning, it releases gas and the gas can make the thing explode and that's what happened in this case.
You may not know much if anything about Jean-Jacques Rousseau but you've probably heard the well-known quote man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. In his early work Rousseau argued that mankind was happiest and at its best in a state of nature that is before the creation of society and civilization. He saw society as artificial and corrupt and that good people were corrupted by it. The Social Contract is perhaps the most enduring and well-known of his books covering pretty well every aspect of man in society. However, in this book his attitude to the condition of man in a state of nature changes in such conditions man is brutish and competitive by nature and there is no law or morality. Therefore, because it is easier to survive by joining forces with others people form societies to better fight anything that might endanger their situation. Rousseau's political philosophy has had a profound influence on Leida thinkers even though or perhaps especially because it is open to many interpretations. But political philosophy is not everybody's cup of tea in his own time. Rousseau was a bestseller with novels such as The New Eloise and especially Emile. Though even the latter is not free of his constant desire to improve society it illustrates his ideas about the best form of education which involves educating a child's emotions before their reason. This too had a profound influence on educational theorists. Today we're going to talk some more about architecture and what makes for a good design. There are of course a whole range of qualities that most architects would like their buildings to possess. One of these is the durability of the building. Architects must consider how well the building will stand up to the ravages of climate and time. Will it remain robust and in good condition? Clearly requirements will vary according to the surroundings of the building in question a design that is suitable for Dubai will have different needs from one for Moscow. Then of course it's essential to consider the appearance of the building regardless of what its purpose may be. Will people find pleasure in looking at it an original and still respected writer on architecture? The Roman Vitruvius wrote in the first century that a building should delight people and should raise their spirits again. Tastes may vary from one society to the next but the principle remains the same.
Electricity serves the housewife like a housemaid. It has provided her enough leisure to rest or to give better attention to her children. Science has taken upon itself even the mental jobs. It does all the back-breaking and dangerous jobs for him. Science has shared a great contribution. Books are printed in large numbers at cheap rates. The newspapers add a great deal to our knowledge and give us exact information. Electricity has made the daily life of the common man. It is quite different from what it used to be. It has eased agricultural and industrial activities. Today mobile phones have become a very important gadget. It can be seen in everyone's hand. It is true that with mobile phones, life has become easier. People can contact each other whenever they want to, or if there is an emergency one can make a call from wherever he or she is. Along with these advantages it has its abuses also. People talk while driving, which leads to many accidents. Students waste a lot of time by playing games on the mobile phone all the time or talking to friends. This is a big distraction as studies suffer because of this. Thus, mobile phones are indeed a very good device, only if it is used properly, otherwise it can be very dangerous.
Trust is one of the most important aspects of relationship. Medicine cures the physical ailment of a person but trust and care help a person recover mentally. A trustworthy person will be dependable and honest with you. They will not lie, steal, cheat, lose devotion in something or turn their back on you over trivial matters. Integrity, honesty, reliability and loyalty are the easy ways to describe trustworthiness. Integrity is believing in yourself and standing up for what you believe in. Life will be difficult if there is no trust between husband and wife, parents and children, friends and neighbors, etc. When trust is lost it is irreparable. Hello. Professor Steve. Would you elaborate how economic growth is location-specific? Thank you. Alan. Today I would like to talk about relationship between natural resources and economic development of the country. The world's also been defined by the basic fact that the location of these vital minerals and energy deposits is highly variable around the world. You're looking here at a map depicting the coal deposits in the world. Lots of coal in North America, in Russia, China, India, Australia, South Africa. But look at the rest of Africa, almost devoid of coal, almost impossible for Africa to industrialize in the 19th century until, indeed, until very recently. A lot of South America with very limited coal deposits. In the next picture, you're looking at oil reserves, where they're located. Of course, the Middle East is the center of about 70% of the proven reserves of oil around the world. Again, much of Africa, devoid of oil. Again, another great limitation to Africa's economic development until recently. The United States, blessed with oil just as it was blessed with coal, blessed with almost everything. A continent of vast mineral resources. The next map shows you where natural gas is produced. Again, in parts of Russia, the former Soviet Union, the Middle East, the United States, of course. Sad, again, for Africa, not many major natural gas producers. Well, a short history really requires days, months to discuss this core subject of how mineral resources and energy resources transformed the world time and again and shaped geopolitics. Where there's been oil, coal, and gas, there's been a competition that's intense.
it seems as though people are starting to suffer from global warming fatigue. In other words, they're tired of hearing about how our climate's changing for the worse and how we're destroying the planet with pollution. People do care but there's a lot of talk little action and certainly no solution yet. The stories people see in newspapers focus on the negative. They talk about how politicians are choosing the economy over the environment especially in these difficult economic times. And they write about people whose lives have been negatively affected by extreme climate change. Why should we spend our free time reading articles that make us feel depressed and probably quite helpless? Global warming campaigners must turn sad stories into happy ones. They should talk about the actions that are having a positive effect on climate change so that people become interested again and feel motivated to continue taking action. Have you ever seen a situation where an animal is repeatedly put in a negative situation that it can't escape eventually the animal will stop trying to avoid the source of the problem. Instead it starts behaving as if it's completely helpless to change the situation. This state of limited control is called learned helplessness. The animal has opportunities to escape from this environment but the learned helplessness prevents it from taking any action. We have seen it a number of different animal species but we also see this behavior in people. Say for an example, a child who does poorly in math tests will quickly begin to feel that nothing he does will have any effect on his performance. Then later when that same child is faced with any math task is probably going to experience that same feeling of helplessness on another occasion. What this means is that small problems can often become much worse because of this.
I should say one more thing about theory. It's a. It's great to discover theory, but there. The. You have to lose a lot, and you may have noticed, or maybe you didn't, how much you lose. Partly you don't notice it much because here at the university everybody's dedicated to theory, and what is. What's left out is. A. Uh, perception cause you you use your mind not your eyes. Skill you're not supposed to have to have any particular. A. Uh, sort of bodily kind of skills. There's a kind of mental thing. But I'm not. Let's not call that skill. I'm just calling skill the way you cope with everyday stuff that you use and so forth. Intuition. It's not fair to have intuition. I mean you can have intuition. But it's not, it's not theory, it's not something that everybody has to believe until you can put it into language and argue for it. Gets rid of emotions, the body, tradition. University is one of the happiest times of our life, if you go to university that is. I totally loved my university days, I also loved my university. I have three great years of being a student, it was the first time I lived alone without my parents, I had to cook, wash, and clean for myself. I loved it, I had complete freedom. I also loved the studying, it's much more interesting than studying at school. It was nice to just wander along to a lecture through the reading and do the assignments. I really felt like I was learning something. I also loved the social life at university. It's almost 24-7. There were always parties and things to do. You just have to get the right balance between. Atmospheric pressure can support a column of water up to 10 meters high but plants can move water much higher. The sequoia tree can pump water to its very top more than 100 meters above the ground, and until the end of the 19th century the movement of water in trees and other tall plants was a mystery. Some botanists hypothesized that the living cells of plants acted as arms, 
but many experiments demonstrated that the stems of plants in which all the cells are killed can still move water to appreciable heights. Further explanations Movement of water in plants have been based on root pressure. A push on the water from the roots at the bottom of plant. Root pressure is not nearly great enough to push water to the tops of tall trees. Furthermore, the coniferous which are among the tallest trees have unusually low on. Being attentive in traffic is important. This we must teach to every child, to be safe, if at all they go out without an adult help. People who follow proper traffic rules are always safe and keep others safe too. We need to learn all the traffic signs. We can identify some of them easily. Mandatory signs are signs which ensure safety in a free flow of traffic. They are marked in a red circle. The violation of these signs is a legal offense. Cautionary signs are signs which provide warnings of certain dangerous conditions either on or near the road. They are marked with red triangles. Informatory signs are signs which provide useful information about destination and distance, geographical and historical data and other places along the road. Newspapers Canada has been actively concerned with the state of freedom of information in Canada since 1997. Reporters and editors with experience in FOI had long complaints of governments restricting information despite legislative guarantees of access. In order to assess the seriousness of the match, the Canadian Newspaper Association initiated an annual FOI audit in 2005. The problem of the national survey is to gather objective information on the health of Canada's access to information restore and test how readily officials disclose information that should be publicly available on request.
Design of modern cities is a challenge for urban planners. Design of modern cities is a challenge for urban planners. The use of wind energy has increased rapidly. The use of wind energy has increased rapidly. You can make an appointment to meet the librarian. You can make an appointment to meet the librarian. The field study on Wednesday has been cancelled. The field study on Wednesday has been cancelled. Now crack your PTE sitting at your home. Language Academy brings to you the smartest AI-powered practice portal. 
with instant scores and feedback for all the tasks. Along with the practice questions, access free sectional and full mock tests, and get instant scorecard with in-depth feedback and analysis. For more hidden secrets, tips, strategies, and proven templates, click the link below and subscribe to our video course today.